Scottish pleasure. Wasn't it grand, Kate? It was wonderful, dear. Well, I hope you weren't too loud, Mrs. Marshall. Oh, not loud, Alan. Exuberant. Well, what's the point in singing at all if you have to sing quietly? I thought it had a grand lilt, and I'm nominating all of you honorary Highlanders. What next, Dr. Marshall? Hail Caledonia, or maybe Road to the Isle, <sighs> or Sweet and Low. Remember, I have a little boy upstairs who's trying to sleep. Singers, let's rest on our laurels. It is a little late. Yeah. We should be leaving. No, don't rush off like that. We'll have some more tea. Well, I'll take a little more, Mrs. Marshall. Fine, Joe. And how about another piece of cake? Oh, well, I've already had two. Well, three's a charm, Joe. Eat up. I'll have some more tea, please. Oh, you earned a second cup, Nancy. You sang like a true lassie. It's easy to sing when you lead us, Dr. Marshall. And what about you two? Will you have more tea and cake? Or are you living on a diet of love alone these days? Peter. Well, Kate, they are engaged. And engaged people have been known to live on love. Or is that an old-fashioned notion, George? I don't think so, sir. And what about you, Susan? You've been as quiet as a mouse all evening. A church mouse, that is. I just haven't anything to say. Oh, you're getting a rare woman for a wife, George. <laughs> the speechless variety. Don't let them badger you, Susan. Come have some more tea. Thank you, Mrs. Marshall. I'll get the tea for you, Sue. No, that's all right. I'll go. Lost in meditation, Alan. Oh, no, sir. I was just thinking how different these meetings are. I mean, now that you're pastor at Newark Avenue. You mean noise here? Well, no, sir. I mean... He means now they're fun. Well, that's right, Nancy. Had trouble saying the word fun, didn't you? I guess that's it. Because it's still not easy for you to associate fun with a church meeting. You know my aunt. <laughs> Indeed I do. Miss Judith and Miss Jessie. Well, I'm glad you're having fun. Because I am, too. Oh, it's been so wonderful, Dr. Marshall. The change you've made. It's no special change I've made, Barbara. Oh, but it is. Why, do you know how many there were in our young people's group before you came? Twelve. Oh, now there are over two hundred. Still, it's not been all my doing. You've all worked hard. Only because you made us want to work. Why, till you came, I would have never thought of belonging to this bunch. Well, we never did anything but sit and look solemn. The only reason I belong is because my aunt said when they were young. It was dreadful. And then you came, Dr. Marshall. Now New York Avenue is known as a young people's church. So I've been told. But still, I can't take credit for well, all the should, hard you should, Dr. Marshall. I mean, the reason we come is because you treat us as if we had some sense. You don't tell us what's wrong or what's bad. You tell us what's right and what's good. And I think if there were more kid, people like you in this world, kids wouldn't feel so desperate. Uh, maybe we could just sit down and talk about this. Well, I just thought you should take more credit. Thank you, Joe. It's good to know your feelings. Not everyone's as exuberant about my work as you are. But if you enjoy worshiping God, then I'm glad. That's the way I feel it must be. Why can't we serve him with a smile and a song as well as with a sigh? And I've talked myself dry, Kate. Well, I think that evenings like this are good for all of us. Uh, we still haven't decided what to do about the youth room. Before we get back to that, Dr. Marshall, I'd like to ask a favor. Ask, Nancy. Well, my high school has quite a reputation in Washington for being tough. Tough? Goodness, I'd be scared to go there. Lots of kids feel that way. In fact, it's gotten so bad that this year we can't get speakers for our assemblies. You mean the speakers are afraid of the students? That's right, Dr. Marshall. I've seen them drive a speaker right off the stage, booing, stamping, throwing things. Oh, it sounds awful. What's the favor you wanted to ask? Well, I'm on the senior assembly committee, and we were thinking that maybe just once if the students could hear someone like you. I see. You want to play Nero. Nero? Throwing a Christian to the lions. <laughs> We've got such a busy schedule. I know. Dr. Marshall would like to say yes, Nancy, but he has so many other engagements, and there's been criticism of him speaking so often outside the church. I understand, but I had to ask. We hate to disappoint you, Nancy, but we must draw the line somewhere. Isn't that true, dear? Oh, yes, Kate. Yes, indeed. Mrs. Marshall is 100% right. Well, that's a failing of hers. I am overbooked. I have been criticized for outside speaking. I should draw the line. It's all right, uh, Dr. But Marshall. But I must be very, very careful where I draw that line. I might wish to step across it one day. Peter. When is it you wanted me to speak, Nancy? Oh, Dr. Marshall, are you sure? I'm sure. It's my poor <laughs> wife who has her doubts. Well, to give you plenty of time, we have an assembly scheduled for November 10th. 
That's a Friday afternoon at 2. Six weeks off. I'll be there. Be prepared for the worst. They shoot paper wads, use pea shooters, and throw pennies. All contributions will be gratefully accepted. And as for the pea shooters, I might come armed myself. You draw a grand line, Mrs. Marshall. But you'll forgive me for pretending it wasn't there this once. This once. Now on with the business of this meeting. Well, we come back to the same problem, sir. The youth room. When there were only a dozen kids, that room was all right. But now it's impossible. We wouldn't need much money to fix it up. Surely the trustees... The trustees are enthusiastically in favor of improving the youth room, provided it doesn't cost any money. Well, how much would we need? Well, we could do a lot with $100. Well, why doesn't your group sponsor a fundraising activity? Like a bake sale, Mrs. Marshall? That's a possibility. We might have a concert. Dr. Marshall, you could sing Scotch songs. A bonny notion. But I've got a better idea. What? Let the young people put on a play. A play? That's a wonderful idea, dear. It's a great deal of work, but it can be very satisfying. Have you ever acted, Dr. Marshall? Oh, indeed he has. He was a sensation in Atlanta. Well, would you help us, sir? As much as I can. You'd have to choose the play. What play were you in, Dr. Marshall? I forget the name, but it was a grand success. I played an Arab sheik. An Arab sheik? Oh, you must have been wonderful. Well, he was the first Arab sheik in the history of theater with a Scotch burr. I was persuaded to take the role. You can imagine how difficult that was. Oh, this was before my marriage, and there were no lines drawn for me yet. Well, he was much, much freer. I can just picture you in an Arab costume, Dr. Marshall. It was dashing. We worked very hard to be authentic. Excuse me, that's probably my mother, Mrs. Marshall. Your mother? Do you remember any of your lines? Let me see. Or perhaps if I got into the spirit of it. <laughs> Golly, you really look like an Arab. Uh, you be mignon. She was a heroine. Mignon. What a romantic name. Now mignon is alone. And suddenly I appear and you ask, are you a genie? Are you a genie? All right. Your line. Give your line. Uh, are you a genie? No, madam. I am an Arab. Peter, dear, a very pleasant surprise. Not now, Kate. Can't you see I'm an Arab? I am Ali, prince of the house of Hashin, descendant of Ali. Son of Fatima, Dr. daughter of Khadijah, first and beloved wife of the Prophet please, Muhammad. Please, Dr. Marshall, Stay so in character. You're Mignon, I'm Ali. But There's no one else here. That's very important. <laughs> Peter. I have come to take you away. Far. Far. Away. <laughs> Miss Pickle and Miss Pickle. Dr. Marshall. Won't you come in? We seem to be interrupting. Oh, no. Uh, Dr. Marshall was just showing us a scene from a play, Aunt Judith. The young people thought they might put on a play to help raise funds for redecorating the youth room. I believe it was made at the meeting, at the last meeting of the trustees, that the church has more immediate problems than redecorating the youth room. But if we raise the money... Alan, I came here to speak with Dr. Marshall. Yes, Aunt Judith. Of course, if we're intruding. Oh, no. We're delighted to see you. That was obvious. The meeting was just breaking up. We really shouldn't have dropped in at this hour. But it's so difficult to catch Dr. Marshall in these days with all his outside interests. Well, I think the idea of putting on a play is just perfect. We'll present it to the group at our next meeting. Okay. Good night, Dr. Marshall. Mrs. Marshall? Good night. I'll tell the kids at school that we can count on you, Dr. Marshall. I'll be on hand, Nancy. Meanwhile, I'll practice dodging paper wads. Good night, Mrs. Marshall. Thanks for the cake and tea. Well, there's more cake if you'd like, Joe. Uh, no, thanks, Mrs. Marshall. Dr. Marshall, sometime when you've got a minute, there's something I'd like to talk over with you. Of course, Joe, any time. Good night. I'll help you with the dishes, Mrs. Marshall. Well, that's very thoughtful of you, Susan, but you need to stay. I'd like to. I am waiting for my mother to pick me up anyway. Why should your mother pick you up? I'll give you a ride. I'd rather you didn't, George. Hey, Sue, I Please. Can... I'll call you later. Good night. What's happened with me and Sue, Mrs. Marshall? Let me talk to her, George. 
I'd sure appreciate it. Good night. Good night, George. Won't you sit down, ladies? Alan, you may wait for us outside. Yes, Aunt Judith. Good night, Dr. Marshall. Mrs. Marshall. Goodbye, Alan. <coughs> now, could I offer you ladies some tea and cake? Why, that might be No, great. no thank you, Mrs. Marshall. Then if you'll excuse me. I'm sure Mrs. Marshall will be right back. Of course. <laughs> I'm sure you must be tired, Dr. Marshall. Oh, no, not at all. I find it fatiguing just to read of all your comings and goings. New York Avenue's never had a minister who was so in the public eye. Why, that was a lovely picture of you and yesterday. Jesse! Sorry, Judith. It may seem to you, Miss Bickle, that I spend a great deal of time with my outside speaking engagements. Indeed, it does. It's very hard for me to refuse. As pastor of New York Avenue, you should be mature enough to put first things first. First things first? Exactly. Your first responsibility is to New York Avenue. I've tried not to be neglectful of my duties. You're a very young man. Some seem to find your energy, your enthusiasm refreshing. To me, it is disturbing. I see. Do you? New York Avenue has been our life. My sister and I have grown up here. We listen to many great ministers speak in our church, and we cherish its traditions. I can understand that, Miss Bickle. One of those traditions, Dr. Marshall, is moderation in all things. Moderation. And you feel that I'm immoderate? I'm sure Yes, you... I think you are, Dr. Marshall. You cater entirely too much to these <clears throat> teenagers. I am deeply aware, Miss Bickle, of my responsibility to the young people. But I have never Long time done... parishioners like my sister and me are ever aside by adolescents who are attracted to the flashy aspects of your ministry. Oh, Judith, I don't think that you Kindly have... stop telling people what I mean and don't, Jesse. I feel there's important work to be done among the young people. If they are attracted to the church because of me, it is only because they have a deep hunger for God. But he is still not real to them. I have to find a way to make him real. Your methods are much too unorthodox for New York Avenue. The church of the presidents need to resort to that sort of sensationalism to attract the type of church member we want. The type of church member you want, Miss Bickle, is a li- Mercy! Another example of what I mean, in moderation. I'm sorry I was so long. I was saved by the bell. <laughs> We've so enjoyed your nephew, Alan. He's such a fine young man. A real credit to your care. Alan is sweet, isn't he? We couldn't feel close. Alan is stubborn and undisciplined in many respects. He wastes too much time, like this painting he does. Well, surely his painting is a healthy outlet. In recent months, I've noticed a marked increase in his irreverent attitudes. I've never found Alan irreverent. In fact, we hope that he might have a call to the ministry with a little encouragement. We'll guide Alan in the choice of his vocation, and if we need any assistance, we'll ask for it. I, I only meant that... You mustn't do <coughs> Mrs. Marshall, but Judith doesn't appreciate... Jesse, I did not come here to discuss my nephew. As you know, I am the president of the New York Avenue Missionary Society. Of course. And since the society's founding, it has been customary for the pastor of New York Avenue to address the autumn meeting. I presume it will not work of a hardship on you, Dr. Marshall, to be present this year? I'm looking forward to it. Good. We meet Friday, November 10th at 2. November, November 10th at 2? That's Last year, I did not feel your remarks were pertinent, Dr. Marshall. So this year, I prepared a few notes in the preparation of this year's address. I trust you'll find them helpful. I'm sure I will. Come, Jesse. Alan is waiting. I'll see you to the door, Miss Bickle. You mustn't take Judith too seriously, Dr. Marshall. She, she has very definite ideas about almost everything. So I've noticed. The thing to do is stand up to her. Don't be intimidated. Jesse! Yes, Judith. See what I mean? <laughs> Get my soda box. The inner man is seething. Now, Peter, you've been taking so much soda lately. I'm flashy, sensational, immature, immoderate, and attracting the wrong kind of church member to New York Avenue. It was very, very fortunate, Kate, that nine o'clock struck when it did. <laughs> now, you know, Miss Bickle, it's only speaking for a handful. Why, the That's majority... not the point, Kate. The feeling is here. And when I stand in the pulpit, I remember it. It hampers and restricts me. Maybe I do move too fast. 
Maybe I am wrong for accepting outside engagements, but I can't <laughs> refuse. It's not in me. If only I could help more. No man needs more help. Just knowing you're with me is a great comfort. A man needs his wife to lean on. I want to be strong for your sake, Peter. Strong and steady. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to No apology is called for, Susan. Come in, sit down. Susan's troubled about her engagement to George. Troubled? In what way? The idea of marriage seems to frighten Susan, dear. Well, now, Susan, I think it's fine to be in awe of marriage, but to be George scared... George thinks it's childish. Well, have you discussed this with your mother? Oh, no. Mother's so busy. Surely not too busy to be concerned about your happiness. That's probably Mother now. I'll let her in. You love George, don't you, Susan? I thought I did. And George loves you. Dear, you remember Mrs. Grant, Susan's mother? Of course. Nice to see you again, Mrs. Grant. Thank you. Sorry to be so late in calling for Susan, if you're ready, dear. Uh, yes, Susan mother. tells us she's troubled about her upcoming marriage. She shouldn't have bothered you, Dr. Marshall. It's no bother. We're very fond of Susan and of George. It's a mood that will pass. George is a fine young man with a great deal of promise. Susan couldn't have done better. And anyway, she doesn't really have a choice. She's not prepared to make a career. Marriage is her only answer. You've had a most successful career, haven't you, Mrs. Grant? I have no complaints. I have more commissions than I can handle. And your husband is in government service, I believe. Yes, Stephen still has the same job he did when we were married. I was wondering, perhaps you and your husband and Susan and George could have dinner with Catherine and me one evening soon. Stephen and I, I'm afraid not, Dr. Marshall. Well, surely one evening we could Nothing would be gained by bringing Stephen into the matter. Isn't he already concerned? He's Susan's father. Your suggestion is impractical, Dr. Marshall. Come along, Susan. It's getting late, and I still have three hours work to do. Good night, Dr. Marshall. Mrs. Marshall. Good night. And thanks. Good night, Susan. And please, don't say anything more to Mother. Something's very much amiss in that family, Kate. I held my breath. I thought you were about to lecture Mrs. Grant on the folly of mixing marriage and a career. The thought occurred to me, but then I looked at the clocks and it's a long wait until 10, so I couldn't count on the bell to save me again. <coughs> I'm so sorry for Susan. I still mean to bring that family together, Kate. When we do, we'll find out Susan's reasons for being afraid to marry. Oh, I'm in dire need of soda. What with being an Arab sheik and listening to Judith Bickle and... Oh, Judith Bickle, I forgot. What did you forget? The meeting of a missionary society is November 10th at 2. So I'll have plenty of time to memorize her notes. No, November 10th at 2. That's when you promised Nancy you'd speak at her high school assembly. Soda. I've got to have soda. I need an immoderate amount of soda. <laughs> This is not my night. <laughs> Hello, Senator. As neighbors, we don't seem to see much of each other and... Oh, yes, Senator. We did have a youth meeting here tonight. Now, Senator, I'm sure none of our young people would... I know you're an authority on juvenile delinquency, Senator, but I'm sure your man was mistaken, Senator. None of our young people would trespass in your property or try to break into your garage. No, no, I will not insult these young people by questioning them. You may take it up with my trustees if you like. Good night, Senator. Wings of a tub. Well, what was that all about? Our 
Our good neighbor, Senator Polk, thinks some of the young people are trying to steal equipment from his garage. Oh, Peter. He means to take the matter up with the trustees. So batten the hatches, Mitch. It looks like... Sure, it's okay with them. They got enough problems with their own kids, and they don't want to be bothered with me. Joe, Dr. Marshall will be home soon. He's speaking at the Missionary Society. I, I wish you'd wait. I can't. I shouldn't uh, be here at all. I just had to say thanks. You've both been so swell. And no matter what you hear, remember, I'll always appreciate what you did. Well, what will we hear, Joe? It's nothing you want to be mixed up in. Goodbye, Mrs. Marshall. Joe! Tell Dr. Marshall not to blame himself. He did all he could. I guess they're right. Some guys are just born no good. Joe, wait! Peter, John, Marshall, get back in here and eat your supper. No, mother, mother! What is it, Peter, John? He won't eat his supper. Why not, Peter, John? Because it's shredded wheat. But I thought you liked shredded wheat. I do, but I already had it for breakfast and lunch. Oh. Hold that. I never heard of no one getting too much shredded wheat. Daddy will be home soon, and he'll fix you what you want. But not things going to be like they used to be. Soon, dear. I like Hilda. I like all the other ladies, mm -hmm. but they don't cook like you do. Well, you must pray, Peter John. Pray that God will make me well again. I do, Mother. Every day I do. Daddy's home! Hi! And how's we, Peter, this evening? Fine, but I'm not we, Peter, anymore. <laughs> oh. 
And who are you? I'm Big Peter. I see. And who am I? You're enormous Peter. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent idea. E.P. and B.P. And how's Kate? Fine, dear. How's the Missionary Society meeting? Uh, missionary Society meeting? Did Miss Bickle like your speech? Oh, you don't want to hear about that. Look, here's Alan to say hello. Well, I don't mean to stay, Mrs. Marshall. Oh, it's kind of you to stop by, Alan. Oh, that reminds me. Joe Keating stopped by earlier. He was really upset. He said he was leaving town. Really? I've worried about Joe. He hasn't been attending church regularly. Daddy, I'm hungry, and Hollis says I have to eat shared wheat. No! Well, suppose you and I have a man-to-man -man talk with Holda. Alan, tell Mrs. Marshall your idea for the mural. All right, sir. Are you afraid of Holda, Daddy? Not if you hold my hand. <laughs> now, Alan, what's this idea? Well, you know how, how we've had some trouble fixing up the youth room. Yes. Well, I've been doing a little painting. I'm not very good, but, well, I found some way to let off steam. <coughs> I'm sure it is. Well, Dr. Marshall was thinking maybe I could do a mural on one wall of the youth room. What, what would your subject be? Well, you know his sermon on the calling of the Twelve Apostles. Oh, I think it's one of his best. So do I. He makes the apostles so real, like flesh and blood. I'd like to try to capture the spirit of that sermon in my painting. I think that's an inspired idea, Alan. I've been sort of fumbling, you know, trying to find myself. Maybe this will help me, too. I'm sure it will. Oh, if I can just capture his spirit. The Christ of the gospel striding up and down the dusty miles of Palestine. Suntan, bronzed, and fearless. You can, Alan. I know you can. And would you mind? Holo's allergic to bells. Be glad to. We mustn't stay. Mother will be worried. Is that Nancy? Yes, Mrs. Marshall. And Barbara. We don't want to disturb you, Mrs. Marshall. But Nancy was so excited, she just had to come thank Dr. Marshall. Is he here? He's in the kitchen with Peter John. I'll tell him as guests. What's all the excitement? What are you thanking my husband for? You should have heard him. He was superb. I'm green with envy. Heard him? Where? When? Why, at our high school assembly this afternoon. High school assembly? But he was supposed to address the New York Avenue Missionary Society. No. He promised Nancy he'd speak at her high school. Don't you remember? Oh, dear. I was so afraid those kids would humiliate me by booing Dr. Marshall. Oh, I would have given anything to have been there. After I introduced him, I was all braced for trouble. I couldn't relax and listen. But then I realized it was quiet in the auditorium. There were no boos or catcalls, no pea shooters or paper wads. Everyone was listening and watching. Tell about the gardenia. Suddenly, I heard Dr. Marshall telling about my favorite flower, the gardenia. What did he say? He said, you know, a gardenia's petals reveal any telltale finger marks by turning brown. Your lives are like that. Purity is like that. Young people don't give anything to the world to destroy. Don't be ashamed of high ideals, dreams, and beautiful thoughts. That is lovely, Nancy. He said the best he could ask was that God might plant in our hearts a yearning to meet the Galilean and know him as our friend. After he finished, there wasn't a sound. Then the whole place shook with applause. They cheered and shouted, there's never been anything like it, never. Well, hello, Nancy, Barbara. Oh, Dr. Marshall, I was just telling Mrs. Marshall about, about your address to the high school. I guess I forgot to mention that I decided to speak at the high school instead of at the missionary <laughs> society meeting. Yes, you forgot. It was a very fine audience, Nancy. Only because of you. I didn't get a chance to see you afterward, and I wanted you to know. I'm glad you came by. Maybe someday you'll speak at my high school, Dr. Marshall. Oh, of course, Barbara. But don't make it too soon. No, wait till the next meeting of the Missionary Society. <laughs> I better be going too, sir. All right, Alan. Good luck with the mural. Oh, and if you should hear of anyone who'd like a housekeeping job with a quiet, well-behaved family, Send them right over, will you? Yes, Dr. Marshall. We certainly will. Goodbye. Peter Marshall. Now, Kate, I had to go to that high school. But the Missionary Society. Miss Bickle. Miss Bickle and the Missionary Society didn't really need or want me this afternoon. Those kids did. But what did you tell her? I asked Dr. Evans to go, and I sent a note of apology. There'll be trouble. Very likely. Hello. Oh, yes. Yes, Mrs. Grant. Susan? Just
just a moment. Has Susan Grant been here this afternoon? I'm sorry, Mrs. Grant, we haven't seen her. All right, if she stops by, we'll have her phone you at your office. Susan's missing? If her mother can't locate her, it seems they've had a misunderstanding. Mrs. Grant sounded quite concerned. But wait, in all this flurry, I haven't asked the most important question of all. How are you? Oh, don't ask. I'm just looking for an excuse to cry. Poor girl. I know how difficult it is, lying here day after day. Lying here when I should be helping you. Oh, Peter, just when you need somebody strong and steady to lean on, here I am, weak, useless, a burden to you. I try not to give in to it, but days like this, and now Holda's leaving. We've no one to take her place. Who could take Holda's place? <laughs> She's unique. Who else could clean our room and make it look dirtier? All right, Holda's no treasure. That's generally agreed. She's better than no housekeeper at all. By a very, very narrow margin. <laughs> Peter, be serious. What are we going to do? Find someone else. This could go on and on. Maybe I'll never be well. Catherine. I know. I should have faith in him. Well, at first I did, Peter. At first? Kate, are you setting a time limit on God's mercy? Are you telling him when to help you? How to help you? No, Peter. You just can't understand. You're so strong, so sure. I pray and pray, and when I seem to get no better, <laughs> I guess I'm not worthy of his help. Kate, Kate. You're like we, Peter, when he brings me a toy to be fixed. He's tried himself and failed, so he brings it to me. Then what does he do? He stands by, advising, criticizing. Sometimes he even gets so impatient that he takes the toy right out of my hands. Isn't that what you're doing to our Heavenly Father? I don't know. You've gone to him for help, but now you're impatient with him because he's not proceeding in the way you think is best. All I ask is what's best for all of us, Peter. Kate, our worries are in his hands. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Let's ask him for strength, Kate, and patience. Hear us, dear Lord, as we pray for some who need stronger hearts. Thou art the great physician who can do it. Wilt thou strengthen the hearts of them we name even now? We pray for some who are sick of tuberculosis. While human skill can do this and that and say, wait and rest, we know that thy skill can heal lungs. Hear us, dear Lord, as we pray for this. Thank you, dear. More visitors. Holda thinks we know too many people. We are immoderately social. <laughs> I don't think Holda means to answer it. Those who have ears to hear, and hear not. Um, your doorbell's ringing. How very, very <laughs> observant you are. I'll see who it is on my way out. This is goodbye, then. It is. The little boy wants you to put him to bed. All right. There's cold hash for supper, or you can warm it if you're finicky. Hot or cold, it tastes the same. Peter, whoever's at the door? I'm going. Just one thing more. In spite of everything, Dr. Marshall, I want you to feel free to use my name anytime you folks need a reference. <laughs> Kate, did you hear that? <laughs> I heard. Well, aren't you overwhelmed by Holder's generosity? Excuse me. Susan. The woman at the door said to come in. Of course. As a matter of fact, we've been expecting you. Expecting me? Your mother phoned a little while ago. What did she tell you? Only that she was worried. She wants you to phone her. Oh, Dr. Marshall, what am I going to do? What's wrong, Susan? I have no right to come here and trouble you. You know we want to help you. There was no one else I could turn to. You've quarreled with your mother. And with George. It was terrible. They tried to make me set the date for the wedding. Dr. Marshall, I just can't marry George feeling the way I do. Do you doubt George's love? Oh, no, George has been wonderful. I'm all the blame. And you think running away will help? I only thought that I, if I could get away from Mother for a little while, 
I know this is a terrible time for you, that Mrs. Marsh was sick, but I felt if I could stay with you for a few days. You know we want to help you, Susan, but we are short-handed. I wouldn't be any trouble. Of course you can stay, Susan. Thank you. But you must phone your mother. Must I? We'll only start quarreling again. Well, I'll call her. Try to explain. That would be wonderful, Dr. Marshall. That doorbell is louder than Joshua's trumpet. Well, I don't want to see any more visitors. If Susan would help me upstairs. Of course. And I'll show her where she can put her things. I'm coming. I'm coming. You know, I'm beginning to sympathize with Holda. Daddy, Daddy, I'm ready for bed! Just a minute, son. This is an unexpected pleasure, Senator. I'm not here for small talk. Where's that young thief? Won't you sit down, Senator? Don't think you can stall me. I listened to you six weeks ago, and this is the result. What is the result? One of those delinquents you coddle here has stolen more than $50 worth of equipment from my garage. You must be mistaken, sir. I'm not mistaken. We have proof. An accomplice and a man who admits receiving the stolen goods. Just who is it you're accusing, Senator? A boy named Joseph Keating. Joe? We know he was here to see you this afternoon, Marshal. Now, if you're wise, you'll tell me where he's hiding. I don't know. Joe did come by here, but I don't was think out. you can shield this boy. This is one time my methods for dealing with juvenile delinquents will be enforced. Senator Polk, if Joe is guilty, I'm he sure. He is, and I've no doubt that we'll find that I'm only one of the people in this neighborhood the young hoodlum is victimized. Daddy, Daddy, doorbell's ringing. Answer it, will you, son? Senator Polk, I know a great deal about Joe. He comes from a family that is. I'm broken. not interested. You let these young people use you, Marshal. You're too soft-hearted. I personally feel your coddling methods encourage juvenile delinquency. I don't know what you consider coddling, Senator, but I assure you that I have never done anything to encourage these young people. A crime is a crime. Anyone who violates the law must be punished. Age and background have nothing to do with it. Daddy, Daddy, two ladies are here and one of them is mad. Miss <laughs> Pickle. And Miss Bickle. Senator Polk. Good evening, ladies. Dr. Marshall, I think you owe me and the 200 ladies of New York Avenue Missionary Society an explanation. 200 ladies? Are they all with you? The telephone is ringing, Dr. Marshall. Is there anything I can do to help? Yes. Get Daddy a soda box. And hurry. What is it? Dr. Marshall will be coming home from church soon. And I know. I talked to him after the service. He's the one who suggested that I stop by. He did? Yeah. He preached <coughs> a wonderful sermon at the 11 o'clock service, Sue. About, about marriage. He preached the same sermon at 9 o'clock. Sue, you've been here a month. It's been a marvelous month. A lonely month for me. That night I came here. I was running away. For me? Partly. But from mother, home, even myself. Oh, George, I was so mixed up and miserable. Why did you come here? I don't know. Or at least I didn't. Something, someone just seemed to tell me to come to the Marshalls. It's been a bad time for them, too. Sure, Mrs. Marshall being sick and all. I was only going to stay overnight. But suddenly I realized that there was a reason for me coming here. An even bigger reason than just the fact that I felt sorry for myself. A bigger reason? The Marshalls took me in because... Well, because that's the way they are. They were in a terrible spot, George. They needed someone to look after the house. They had been praying night and day for the answer to their problem. And then you walked in. Then I walked in. For the first time in my life, I felt that I was in the right place at the right time. I'm glad, Sue. Dr. Marshall says it was God's will that brought me here. And I believe that. I know that the peace of God has been with me ever since I decided to stay. But for how long? As long as I'm needed. And what about us, our marriage? I know it's not going to be easy for you, George, 
But if you could be patient with me. I can wait as long as need be if I have any reason to hope. Oh, yes, you do. George, I love you. Being here each day has made me more certain of that. I do love you. Then I can wait, Sue. Golly, uh, I forgot. What? What is it? I didn't come alone. Someone else is here to see you. Well, George, I see you found your way. Yes, sir, I was just on my way out to... Let your mail, Susan. Well, that was the idea, Peter John. She's a good cook. <laughs> There's your recommendation, Susan. Since she came, I haven't had straight wheat once. <laughs> is Mrs. Marshall up in our room? Yes, sir. Come on, boy. If George doesn't marry Susan, Daddy... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Clark. Susan, we found your father waiting outside, so we brought him in. Dad. Hello, Sue. I'll be out in the car, Mr. Grant. See you later, Sue. Goodbye, George. Won't you sit down? I mustn't. I only stopped by to say hello, to see that you are all right. I'm fine. George invited me to church this morning. Dr. Marshall preached a moving sermon. On marriage. Sue, since you left, I've been doing a lot of thinking about our home. I mean, our family. So have I, Dad. All this misunderstanding between you and George is my fault. No, Dad. Yes, because I haven't been much of a father. That's not true. Or much of a husband. <laughs> but Sue, don't judge marriage by what you've seen in our home. It doesn't have to be like that. George is a fine young man. Not weak, like me. Dad. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. It's just this morning in church, I saw so clearly where I'd failed you. You haven't. You mustn't feel that way. Well, you're happy here, aren't you? Yes. Your mother can't understand it. It's so simple. She won't listen. Marion distrusts anything simple, easy. Well... I mustn't keep George waiting. It's good to see you happy, Sue. I hope you come back again soon. I want you to know, Dr. Marshall. I'd like to. <clears throat> Sue, Mrs. Marshall's not in her room. And what's more, her robe is lying across the foot of her bed. Her robe? But where could she be? I don't know. Was she feeling worse this morning? She was very quiet. What could she have done? I'll go see if I can find her, sir. Of course you are, but the doctor no, says it. No, not what the doctor says, but I know in my own heart. Oh, Peter, last night I was in the depths of despair. I sensed it was a bad time. I couldn't sleep. I kept going over and over in my mind, the prayers we'd said, the hopes we'd had. I was still awake this morning when you left for the services. I didn't realize it. I lay up there in the quiet, listening to the church bells, and suddenly I saw my mistakes. Mistakes? Oh, Peter. I've been demanding of God. I've been claiming health as my right. And never, not for one second, had I stopped rebelling against my illness. Well, this morning, I saw there was only one way left. Submission to his will. Yes, and I prayed in a new way. I told God I'd done everything I know, no, I know to do, and it hadn't been enough. I was weary of trying to persuade him to give me what I want. If he wanted me to be an invalid for the rest of my life, that was all right. I told him what to do, what he wants with me and my life. Oh, Peter, the minute I said that prayer, I felt a strange new peace. Oh, Kate. I remember the stories in the New Testament of all the people Jesus cured. And with each story, he seemed to tell the person cured to do something. So I asked God what he wanted me to do. And he answered me, Peter. He really answered oh, me. Oh, of course he did. It, it seemed he told me to get up and come tell you. So I have. 
And I just know that it's going to be all right. Oh, I know that too, Kate. Kate, you don't know how long I've prayed for this moment. The moment when you can really trust yourself to him. The answers always seem to come when our faith is so small that we expect the worst. But when we find the courage to take our hands off and really turn the problem over to him, his help is unfailing. Now, Mrs. Marshall, if you'll rest yourself. Dr. Marshall, I've looked everywhere and... Mrs. Marshall, we were so worried. It's all right, Susan. The lost is found. Shall I go on with dinner? Yes, and I think I'll try to have mine with the family. Oh, good. What would we have done without Susan? She was a godsend. And I mean that literally. George and her father stop by after church. Her father? What kind of man is he? Quiet. Reserved. I'm convinced, Kate, we won't solve Susan's troubles until we help her parents in their marriage. Well, Susan's mother doesn't want to be helped. If ever I saw a woman who was convinced she had all the answers, it's Marion Grant. But what must it be like being married to a person who's never wrong? I like it. Kate. <laughs> I'm just teasing you, dear. You'd be the first to admit you were wrong. If I ever were? I'm convinced, Kate, we won't solve Susan's troubles until we sit down and have a talk with her parents. Talk? I almost forgot. Forgot what? Who do you suppose was waiting in my study after the 11 o'clock service? Officers of the Peter Marshall Fan Club? <laughs> Impudent girl. No, it was Joe Keating. Joe? But he's somewhere in New York. Hello, may I speak with Senator Polk, please? Thank you. Joe got the letter I sent him and decided to come back and face the music. I'm so glad, dear, but the senator... Joe's ready, ready to pay back the value of what he stole. And I told him I was sure we could convince Senator Polk that... Hello, Senator. Now, I'm sorry to bother you on a Sunday, but I have some news that will interest you. The boy who took the equipment from your garage, Joe Keating, he's come back. Well, he's agreed to come to the parsonage. In fact, he should be here in a few minutes. Well, I thought if you could slip over, the three of us might sit down and... All right, Senator, we'll expect you. You mean the Senator's had a change of heart? I thought he wouldn't be satisfied until Joe's behind bars. Senator Polk is a reasonable man. <laughs> Are we thinking of the same Senator Polk? Kate. Isn't this the eminent authority on juvenile delinquency whose only solution to the problem is to put everyone between the ages of 12 and 20 in prison? Senator Polk may have been extreme in some of his sentiments, but overall he's a... I know. A reasonable man. And what reasonable solution will he suggest to Joe's problem? Well, I thought perhaps Joe could serve a probation period, reporting two or, two or three times a week to the senator and me. Proving that one misdemeanor doesn't make a hardened criminal? That's it. Actually, this could do a great deal of good. If we can use Joe to so prove... So long as Joe isn't hurt? Of course he won't be hurt. That'll be Joe now. I've got it, Sue. I have never been so scandalized! I'm sorry, Mrs. Marshall. I tried to keep them from coming here. Hello, Alan. What's the trouble? We don't mean to upset you, Mrs. Marshall. I mean Marshall. for everyone to be as upset as I am. Not everyone has your capacity, Aunt Judith. <laughs> now, Alan, what's all this flurry about? Well, it isn't as terrible. It is scandalous. After service, Dr. Marshall, my sister and I went into the youth room. I see. Judith and I have so many memories connected with that youth room. Why, it was there that... Jesse! On one entire wall of that room, we found a coarse and vulgar painting, which my nephew confesses he perpetrated. You mean Alan's mural of the calling of the Twelve Apostles. I mean that blasphemous depiction of Jesus and his apostles with Alan's blasphemy on that wall under your direction, Dr. Marshall. Well, surely, Miss Biggle, Alan hasn't been guilty I've of I've been didn't... guilty of trying to capture the spirit of Dr. Marshall's sermon in paint. And Aunt Judith finds it offensive. Worse than offensive. I've never seen anything like it. And that automatically makes it bad. Of course, Judith and I don't get to art galleries This much. is not an art gallery. This is a room in New York Avenue that a nephew of mine should desecrate our church. It's not exclusively your church, Aunt Judith. There are several hundred other members. I've seen Alan's painting. In fact, I watched it in progress. That is what I find so alarming. That you, the pastor of New York Avenue, should have encouraged a young man this blasphemy. Oh, Judith, that's such a strong word. The painting is startling. Was startling, you mean, Aunt Jessie. Was? Aunt Judith ordered the janitor to paint over it. 
You destroyed Alan's painting? I had no alternative. If the pastor has no concern for the appearances, then we, his trustees, must assume his responsibilities. Miss Bickle, you had no right to obliterate that mural. I had every right. I was protecting our young people and saving my nephew from disgrace. Our young people were enthusiastic about Alan's painting. They seemed to find it inspirational. Inspirational? Yes, Andrew. That's for my being disgraced. You've destroyed the only worthwhile thing I've ever done. Now, Alan, I don't here. think the painting was great, but it did have feeling. I did succeed in capturing a little of Dr. Marshall's vision. That mural was a living testimony to your belief, Alan. It's gone now. And you have the satisfaction of knowing that she destroyed my faith. Now, Alan, you Do don't you know why I had to destroy my painting? Because it was irreligious. No, because it had feeling, and that's unforgivable. Your religion is like everything else about you. Bleak, narrow, and cold. Alan, you you don't go to church because you long for his word and need his consolation. You go in because your family always has. Your religion is just an empty hat. That's enough, Alan! You've opposed Dr. Marsh from, from, from the beginning because he sees religion as a living, vital force. Alan, I know you, you mean my painting because I tried to picture Jesus the way Dr. Marshall did. Suntan, bronzed, and fearless. He wanted a pale, bloodless, anemic look. I won't hear you anymore. can't tolerate anyone else's ideas. Why painted the disciples? Simple fishermen, farmers, workmen. You couldn't bear that, Andrew. It was appalling. They didn't look like your kind of people. They wouldn't be acceptable in your church. It's fine, Andrew. You don't have to worry. Your church is safe. I won't ever set foot in again. Alan, you don't mean that. I do, sir. I'm clearing out. I'm just out of your church, Andrew. It's out of your house and of your tight, narrow little world. Alan, you mustn't do that. Alan! You didn't mean it, Judith. You know, and his I name. hope you're satisfied, Dr. Marshall. <laughs> Miss Bickle, I would have given anything to have spared you this. You've been undermining my influence with my nephew ever since you came. Oh, no. Peter would never And what you've done to Alan, you'll do to others at New York Avenue. You're determined to smash our traditions. Well, I'm just as determined that you won't succeed. I have no wish to smash anything. But different people see things in different ways. I know, and your way is wrong. I've known it in the first, and I shall see to it that others know. Come, Jesse. Alan means so much to her, Dr. Marshall, and to me. You can't believe that I deliberately turned Alan against you. No, I can't. But Judith says... It's Jesse! She... It's so hard to be caught between, Dr. Marshall. All my life, I've been in the middle. Peter, what are you going to do? I don't know, Catherine. Dear, why do you keep on rubbing your arm? Oh, it's it's nothing. It's it's a little tingling sensation, some nerves. Dr. Marshall, there's someone here to see you. To see me? He waited in the kitchen until the big sisters left. Joe! I asked him for dinner. I hope it's all right. It's more than all right. It's obligatory. I saw the Bickles when I was coming in, so I decided to use the back door. Welcome home, Joe. I told Dr. Marshall I didn't want to make any more trouble for you, Mrs. Marshall. There's not going to be any trouble, Joe. I've called the senator. He's agreed to come over. Why don't you sit down? You look tired. I am tired, Dr. Marshall. You get awful tired of running away. I knew all along it was crazy to run. And then when I got your letter, I knew what I had to do. It took courage to come back. I'd have never done it if I hadn't thought about you, Dr. Marshall. I had got no excuse for what I did. I stole. And when that other guy suggested that we break into the senator's garage and steal that equipment, I knew it was wrong, that I had to be influencing him. But instead, I thought of what the money would buy, and I stole. If you needed money, Joe, you should have come to me. But you, you had your own problems, Dr. Marshall, big ones. It seemed like everybody had big problems at the time and didn't want to be bothered with me. So you tried to solve your problem in your own way. And it was the wrong way. Well, the money's all here, Dr. Marshall. If you'll give it to the senator. I want you to do that, Joe. All right. Whatever you say. I know I've got to be punished. That's right, Joe. But there are different kinds of punishment. And I think you've already taken a great deal. That'll be the senator now. I sure am scared, Dr. Marshall. Don't worry, Joe. We're going to stand by you. I'm sure that when we convince Senator Polk it's your first offense and you're willing to repay, he'll be lenient. Yeah, I just hope they don't send me away. I've seen what happens to kids when they're sent away. Don't worry, Joe. No one's sending you anywhere. Dr. Marshall? Just show the senator in, Susan. It isn't Senator Polk who's here. Well, who is it? It's a policeman, sir. 
He says he's been ordered to arrest Joe Keating. I'm criticized if I sing loudly, and I'm criticized if I don't. I like it loud. <laughs> it's father's son. Shall we try something else, Dr. Marshall? Not just now, Barbara. I think Peter John is right. We don't seem to have the same spirit this evening. Perhaps we're thinking of absent friends. Alan, for instance. Has anyone heard from him since last Sunday? No, George. His aunt had been frantic. What did they expect? Alan worked for more than a month on that mural. And now it's hidden under a thick coat of white paint. It was beautiful. Usually I don't care much for painting, but what Alan had done really meant something. I'm sure everyone regrets Miss Bickle's hasty impulse. And no one more than Miss Bickle. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about Joe. So have I, Susan. That's the boy Senator Polk is using as an example? Yes. I think it's so wonderful, Dr. Marshall. You're standing by Joe, no matter what people are saying. And they're saying a great deal. Are you expecting someone, Dr. Marshall? No. Well, Barbara and I really should be on our way. Oh, I have to go home and address Christmas cards. Oh, it doesn't seem possible. Christmas less than a week away. Seems possible to me. <laughs> Look who's here. Alan. You're in the Army. I didn't mean to interrupt a party. Oh, it's not a party, Alan, and you're more than welcome. In fact, we were just talking about you. Sounds very dull. Maybe now that you hear Alan, Daddy will sing loud. If he does, you'll have to hear him from your bed, young man. Oh, please. I'll take him up, Mrs. Marshall. Kiss your mother goodnight. Night, Mama. Good night, dear. Good night, you know, Mama Peter. Good night, Big Peter. Oh, and don't forget to say your prayers. Forget my prayers? Oh, Daddy. Not, of course, Christmas. <laughs> I'm glad we got to see you, Alan. Well, do you have to go? Yes, we must. Will you be stationed near Washington? For a while, at least. Then we'll be seeing you. I hope so, Nancy. Good night, Dr. Marshall, Mrs. Marshall. Good night, girls. Come back soon. We will. The uniform is very becoming, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you sit down, Alan? George! Why don't you and I get started on those dinner dishes? Sure. Oh, no, Mr. Grant, we didn't invite you here to wash dishes. That's all right, Mrs. Marshall. I'd like to. We'll surprise Susan. Come on, boy. It'll be good practice for you. <laughs> Have you been to see your aunts? I, uh, I wrote them from camp. Well, you are going to see them, Alan, aren't you? No, Mrs. Marshall. Well, they've been so worried. Alan, it's a fine thing for a young man to serve his country. But for you to leave college in the There's middle of the There's nothing noble about my enlisting. I'm just running away. From what? My aunts, responsibility, myself. I know you are hurt by your Aunt Judas actions. But is this the answer, hurting her in return? Dr. Marshall, there were times in the past months when I thought I might have a call to the ministry. Catherine and I had high hopes. <laughs> Last Sunday I knew I was wrong. I could never be a minister. Why? I think you have all the qualifications. Well, if I were going to serve him, I'd want to give him my best. I'd try to be as honest and uncompromising as Dr. Marshall is. I can understand that. That painting was my attempt to express myself about him, about the ministry. When Aunt Judith destroyed that, I would never have the courage to fight for my ideals. Well, you're underestimating yourself, Alan. No, Mrs. Marshall, I have the patience nor her strength. Alan, when you give your life to God, he supplies the strength and patience you need. I'm not worthy of him. When the going gets tough, I run away. We all have times when we'd like to run away, Alan. But you don't. I need to be going. I just wanted to say hello. We'll be seeing you again soon. I hope so. Goodbye, Dr. Marshall, Mrs. Marshall. Goodbye, Alan. I wish you'd reconsider about seeing your aunts. The months ahead aren't going to be easy for you. And if you're carrying a grief, I'm sorry, so Dr. Marshall. I have nothing to say to them. Good night. Oh, if only he could understand, Catherine, and forgive. Dear, is your arm still bothering you? No, it's, it's just a habit. You promised me you'd check with the doctor. Next week I will. I've been so busy. Too busy. 
You spent so much time with Joe. Hey, send that boy away, Kate. The senator's making political capital of the case now. He can't back down. It's your philosophy against his. With Joe Keating caught in the middle. Joe would have been better off if I hadn't gotten involved. As an ordinary first offender, he would have been given a suspended sentence. Now Polk is using all his influence to make an example of Joe. I'm trying to discredit you. He and Miss Bickle have called a special meeting of the trustees this week. Do you think any of the other trustees have been influenced? I don't know. I'm prepared for the worst. I've ordered a dozen boxes of soda. I know he's here, and I know you've all been talking about me. Remember, please. Where is he? Good evening, Mrs. Grant. I know he's been coming here looking for sympathy. Mother, don't. If you're speaking of your husband, Mrs. Grant, he is here. We invited him for dinner. You were invited, too. But you told me you had to work. First you took my daughter from me and turned her into a maid. That's not true. I came here because I wanted to. Now it's Stephen. If you'll sit down, Mrs. Grant, What I'll are you try trying to do, Dr. Marshall? Destroy our home? No, Marion. No one could destroy our home because we never had one. Stephen. Dr. Marshall has been helping me understand why we never had a home. Why Susan had to leave us to find out what marriage really is. Leave us? Dad's right. Living here with the Marshalls, I stopped being afraid of marriage. I've seen what it can be. It doesn't have to end like ours, Marion. Two people going their separate ways, sharing nothing, staying together only as a matter of convenience and appearance. If our marriage has failed, it isn't because I didn't try to save it. I don't know what Stephen's been saying about me, Dr. Marshall. Sit down, Mrs. Grant. Sit down. I won't be intimidated. I have no wish to intimidate you or anyone. Why did you assume your husband would be talking about you? Because I know Stephen. He's weak. And if something goes wrong, he has to find someone to blame. Usually me. <coughs> That's strange. In all our conversations, I've never heard him utter one word of complaint against you. In fact, he blames himself for the failure of your marriage. He feels he was indecisive and weak. It seems you agree on one thing, Mrs. Grant. You both blame him for the failure of your marriage. Well, I've never said much, though it hasn't been easy. Hasn't it? What have you sacrificed, Mrs. Grant? Sacrificed? Marriage means sacrifice. A woman has to be ready to give up her own ambitions, lose herself in the life her husband chooses. That's an old-fashioned idea. Of course it is as old-fashioned as the word of God. Where would we be if I hadn't worked? Stayed with my career. Together. Together, in some wretched little subdivision house just getting by. Your husband has always had a good job. He makes a very comfortable living. Why, in a good month, I make as much as Stephen does in half a year. My point is, there was no real economic necessity for your following this career after you were married. Stephen had no drive, no ambition. Then you should have been ambitious for him. But I'm Not for yourself. I wanted Susan to have things. But you've given me the wrong things, Mother. And important things. We've ended up with a, lo with a lot of money, Marion. But our marriage is bankrupt. <laughs> You're all against me. Things have gone wrong, so I'm to blame. Aren't we both to blame? I did what I thought was best. Best for your family? Your marriage? Weren't you just unwilling to make marriage a full-time career? This is the 20th century. Women have learned to mix marriage and career. Have they? I think whenever a woman is forced to work after she is married, it is always a regrettable necessity. Being a wife and mother demands all that the average woman can give. Divide your energies and something suffers. Too often it's the marriage. There's no point in my staying here. It's clear I'm your scapegoat. <coughs> no one's the scapegoat. We want to help you. It's not too late, Marion. Isn't it? I thought Susan was all right, inspired by the Marshalls. Susan's all right. I was thinking of us. If we made a new start, we all could... All right. Excuse yourself by blaming me. I don't care. Mrs. Grant, marriages are made in heaven, but they have to be lived on earth. Heaven only comes to earth as we work for it. If you'll get down on your knees and ask his help, you'll get it. Please, just let me go. I'm, I'm sorry I came here. Marion, wait! don't go! Marion, stay with her. She needs you. <clears throat> well, I guess I better be going. We're glad, could you, we're glad you could drop by, George. And George. Yes, sir? When you and Susan are married, remember what you saw here tonight. 
No two lives become one without some painful adjustments. Every couple has their little quarrels, misunderstandings. Am I right, Mrs. Marshall? Yes, dear. But if you get down on your knees and pray, you'll find him smoothing the way. You just can't pray together and stay mad at each other. Try it. We will, sir. Good night. I'll see him out. Do you think the Grants have a chance, dear? A chance. The sacrifice won't be easy for her. Material success has come to mean too much to her. We have so much to thank him for. For giving us each other, and Peter John. No matter what's ahead, we'll always have his help. And no man needs more than that. Was there anything else? I don't believe so, Susan. Then I think I'll go out. Good night, Dr. Marshall. Mrs. Marshall. See you in the morning. I'm feeling a little tired too, dear. You go on up. I have some work to do. Well, you won't stay down late. Promise? Promise. were striking. Is this Miss Jessie Bickle? Well, I wanted to let you and your sister know that Alan stopped by here tonight. Yes, he seems fine. He said he's written you. Were you planning on answering his letter? I see. I suppose that's your sister's decision. I know she's proud, but Alan is proud too. I'm not suggesting you do anything against Miss Judah's wishes. But forgiveness has to begin somewhere. I know you don't like being caught in the middle. Well, get out of the middle. Take a stand of your own. If you want to write to Alan, write to him. If you care to talk it over with me. No. I, I suppose not. Well, I wanted to let you know that Alan was fine. Goodbye, Miss Jessie. Lord Jesus, when we are wrong, make us willing to change. And when we are right, make us easy to live with. I saw your lights. Thought I'd look in. I'm glad you did, Senator. Won't you sit down? I think better on my feet. Then if you'll excuse me. I suppose you've seen these. Not all of them. They're pretty much the same. Making a big deal out of this Keating case. It's getting out of hand. I agree. All this publicity is bad. You and I at Swartz Point over a delinquent who didn't even belong to the church? But Joe does belong, Senator, and even the if The point he... is, your friends at the church feel you should step out of the picture. This will take the spotlight off the case and the boy's trial can be quickly disposed of. That's simple, is it? Exactly. I can get back to the Senate and you to your <laughs> pulpit. Which is where I should have stayed. A minister's place is in his church. Senator Polk. Joe Keating and boys like him need God's help, and they'll only get it through ministers like me. You consider yourself an expert on juvenile delinquency. I've studied the problem. My report's been widely circulated. I've read those reports. As far as I can see, all they say is you're against juvenile well, delinquency. Now... Everyone's against it, <laughs> deplores it. But what can we do to stop it? I've made my stand clear. Yes, you have. Law enforcement without mercy. Your recommendations are for reprisals against these youngsters who have fallen out of step with our laws. Fallen out of step? You call stealing falling out of step? Yes, I do. A thief must be punished. 
But his age should dictate the kind of punishment he receives. More coddling. Far more important than the punishment we give these youngsters is the help we owe them. Help? Look here, I didn't come here to listen to a lot of your theories. No. <laughs> you came to tell me that I had to desert Joe Keating. Well, I'm telling you that I've no intention of deserting Joe. Your trustees may have something to say on that score. No doubt. But I'm saying this to you, Senator. You and men like you have got to stop thinking of what can be done to juvenile delinquents and start thinking of what can be done for them. You're in no position to be handing out any advice. You come here in your cloak of righteousness like the Pharisees in the New Testament. You've got a stone in your hand, ready to hurl it at Joe and any kid like him. I heard one sermon today. Then hear another. Do you remember what our Lord said to those Pharisees in the New Testament? He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. We've got to stop coming to the problems of our teenagers with stones in our hands. I've made my position clear. We act more childish and willful than these youngsters. We've forgotten the meaning of forgiveness. And there is no greater need in society today than this. The need to forgive. The world is crying out for it. Husbands and wives, parents and children, the need to forgive and be forgiven. Without this, our troubled hearts Our troubled hearts. Dr. Marshall, what is it? Senator Pope, I'm in great pain. Please call my wife. doing what the doctor says for three months and more. I didn't mean to bother you. Bother me? Since when does a boy bother his dad? But I promised Mama. I know. The way your mother and that doctor act, you think my ears were weak instead of my heart. They've taken away my phones, stopped all my clocks, and turned my son into a whisper and pussyfoot. You're being loud, Daddy. The doctor said... I know. All right. Run along and play and leave me to my deafening quiet. Yes, Dr. Marshall, you rang? Yes, I did. And it was such a relief to hear some noise that I think I'll ring again. Can I get you something? Uh -huh. Yes, you can get me my telephone, a blaring radio, and a room full of people. Now, Dr. Marshall, you know what the doctor, doctor says. That man is more quoted than the president. But there's nothing more I can do for you, sir. Oh, but there is. Play me a game of far cheesy. Dr. Marshall. No chess. No, you know perfectly Tiddly well. Tiddly weeks. No games. You get much too excited. Of course I get excited. What's the point of playing a game if you don't? But excitement is bad for you. So the doctor says. I'm of the opinion that all this quiet is much worse. Excuse me. You've even muffled my doorbell. I wonder Kate doesn't make visitors send up smoke signals. Or it'd be much quieter. <laughs> you sound like a pit of vipers hissing out there. Come in. We didn't mean to disturb you. I mean to be disturbed. <coughs> Mrs. Marshall said we could have our meeting in the back garden. Why not have it right here? Well, you know how noisy these meetings are, sir. Uh, the noisier, the better. You may all say hello and then go out to the back garden. Susan, George, this woman is a tyrant. Be warned. I know, sir, but I'm taking her for better or worse. I brought you this book, Dr. Marshall. I hope you'll enjoy it. That's very thoughtful, Nancy. Silence is golden. Now there's an appropriate gift. It was Mrs. Marshall's suggestion. I should have known. I wanted you to have these flowers, Dr. Marshall. Oh, thank you, Barbara. Oh, they're certainly pretty. Oh, better put them in water right away, Susan. 
We wouldn't want these heavy pedals to start crashing to the floor. The den would be unbearable. How are you feeling, sir? Perfect. We certainly miss you. Seems strange to hear someone else preach the Easter sermon. Strange for me too, George, to be here instead of in my pulpit. If he behaves and does as the doctor says, Mrs. Marshall thinks he'll be able to marry George and me. But that's not until June, and this is April. I'm gathering my strength too, sir. <laughs> Nancy and I are going to be bridesmaids. And I've been practicing to catch the bridal bouquet. <coughs> well, what good will it do you, Nancy, with Alan in the army? He won't be in the army forever. How is Alan? Fine. He means to stop by later, he said. Good. I haven't had a real talk with him in months. I should have known. My husband would gather a crowd at the North Pole. I tried, Mrs. Marshall. She did, valiantly. Don't blame your jailer. Not that I want to be inhospitable. She just wants to keep her poor husband isolated. Mom! Dad! Hello, dear. I didn't expect to see you here. They were kind enough to bring me home, so I insisted that they come in and say hello. I thought Peter might be lonely. We can't stay. Come in, come in. We were on our way to the back garden. It's been wonderful seeing you, Dr. Marshall. I hope this hasn't been too much excitement. It's the best medicine I've had. I'll put these flowers in a vase, and I'll see you before you go. We'll stop by the kitchen. Sit down, sit down. We mustn't. Marion and I are going house hunting this afternoon. Oh, really? But the place we have now is so ridiculously expensive and impractical. We want a house with some land. No, I think that is so wise. <coughs> what he means is we want a house designed for grandchildren. Well, with Susan and George getting married in June. And it pays to be foresighted. Dr. Marshall, for a long time I've wanted to thank you. Thank me? That night here, you made me really look at myself. I despised what I saw. If it hadn't been for you... Don't thank me, Mrs. Grant. Thank God. We do. When I think of all the years we've lost because of my selfishness... Don't think of those lost years. Think of the years ahead. Of course. You know, all those years I was struggling to make a career for myself, I had to keep convincing myself that what I was doing was worthwhile. Now I feel as if I'm carrying out a plan, a divine plan. And you wouldn't believe the difference it's made in my work. But I would. Every man needs a wife to understand his work, build him up, encourage his hopes. That's God's intention. Young women need to be helped before they make the mistake I did. You must get well quickly, Dr. Marshall. You're so badly needed. Peter feels that need, Mrs. Grant, but first he First must he must get well. And we're tiring him. Come along, dear. Oh, no, you haven't tired me at all. You can't know how good it makes me feel to see you two here together. I mean, really together. We'll look in again soon. Don't bother seeing us out, Mrs. Marshall. We'll stop by the kitchen and have a word with Susan. Goodbye. Thanks for the lift. God keep you, Dr. Marshall. Isn't that wonderful? The surprising thing to me, Kate, is that so few husbands and wives ask God's help when their marriages are failing? They won't take the time to discover what His grace can do. Of course. First, there must be an agreement. Of course. It doesn't do for the wife to beg him for one thing, while all the time the husband is asking for something contrary. I know. Kate, are we praying toward the same end? Well, we both want you well and strong again. True, but short of that. I don't want anything short of that. Kate, a long time ago in Scotland, I made a bargain with God. Yes, I know. I gave my life to God for him to use however, wherever he wanted. Yes, but that There was... were no ifs, ands, or buts. I gave my life to God and promised to give my best for the ministry, leaving the results, including my health, up to God. But, Peter... My best, Kate. Your best demands too much of you. You know what the doctor said. The doctor's said. not concerned in this bargain of mine. And what about me? Am I concerned? Oh, of course you are. Kate, it's so important that we be in agreement on this. You can serve him, Peters, but in new ways. Ways that won't strain your heart. If you try to work and preach as you did before, you'd just be throwing your life away. Not if I were serving him. There are many kinds of service. Do you want me to avoid those in trouble? Do you want me to refuse to involve myself with men and women who desperately need me? Do you want me to be a narrow, limited man? A minister who always thinks first of himself? Is that what you want? I want you to live. That's all I want. I just want you to live. I'm sorry, Kate. 
I don't mean to upset you. I know. I want to feel as you do, but I'm weak. Maybe I've asked God for too little. Maybe he does want to cure your heart, so you won't have to lead a limited life. Perhaps. But Kate, that's for him to decide. Forgive me. I scold the others for tiring you, and then I come in and stage a scene. Stop blaming yourself, Kate. And don't worry. God will show you the way when the time is right. He always does. Well, I'm just too impatient. Well, I better check on Peter John. Is there anything I can do for you, dear? You might get me a miner's lamp to penetrate this gloom. All right. I'll pull the drapes. But you're to stay in that chair. There. Now, if you'll get me my telephone and my radio... No, positively not. Relax and content yourself. Yes, Simon Negree. Silence is golden. Fool's gold. Ah, saved by the muffled doorbell. <laughs> it's probably, probably something for the young people to in the Send them in here first. Senator Polk. Good to see you, Dr. Marshall. I was dropping Joe off for a meeting, so I thought I'd look in. I'm glad you did. And how's Joe? Fine, sir. You're looking well. You hear that, Mrs. Marshall? I heard. Won't you have a seat, Senator? Thank you. Joe and I just finished our Easter dinner. Sort of a celebration. Celebration? Yes, sir. The Senator thought we should celebrate my new job. New job? Joe's going to be Senate Page, Mrs. Marshall. Starts tomorrow. Oh, Joe, that's wonderful. I'd like to shake your hand again, Joe. We thought you and Mrs. Marshall should be the first to know. I couldn't be happier, for your sake. I know, and for mine. Joe and I have both come a long way since that night I argued with you here, Dr. Marshall. I don't like to think of it as an argument, Senator. Well, let's just say that you stated your viewpoint, and I stated mine. And when I compared the two, I saw how empty mine was. You know, until that night, Dr. Marshall, it had been a long time since I had prayed. I mean, really prayed. Oh, I'd said the standard words, but there'd been nothing in my heart until that night. I'll never forget. You were so helpful. All the time we were waiting for the doctor and the ambulance, I kept thinking about what you said to me about the need for forgiveness. I remember. It occurred to me that if you died that night, I would never get the chance to ask your forgiveness. That you might never know that you had touched me. So I started to pray. I see. At first, I was only praying automatically, but gradually there was a difference. It wasn't just words. I was begging from my heart that you be spared. Thank you, Senator. But as I prayed, I realized that instead of asking your forgiveness, I should do something to prove I was worthy of it. That's why I decided to work with Joe instead of against him. I couldn't believe it the next morning when the Senator came to see me. It wasn't easy. It never is. But as I got to know Joe, I saw how wrong I'd been, trying to fight juvenile delinquency with hate instead of love. Senator Polk, that night just before you came, I was deeply troubled, so I said a little prayer. What was it? Lord Jesus, when we are wrong, make us willing to change. And when we are right, make us easy to live with. Every member of Congress should have that prayer before him. Or even better, sir, the man who thought of it. Right, Joe. What's this? Joe's reminding me that I didn't come here to talk about myself. That's a politician's failing. Doesn't that man know that Daddy can't be where it's loud? <laughs> Peter John. Son, forgive me. After so many years in politics, I've lost my art of being quiet. Mama could teach you. <laughs> she certainly could. Dr. Marshall, Joe and I have had an idea that we think is one of our best. Right, Joe? Right, sir. And we hope you'll agree, Dr. Marshall. I've discussed this with a good many of my colleagues in the Senate, and they seem to be as enthusiastic as we are. Catherine, would you tell the senator that all this suspense is bad for my heart? All right, I'll come straight to the point, which is a great sacrifice for me. <laughs> With your consent, I'd like to nominate you as chaplain of the United States Senate. Chaplain of the Senate? Me? Yes, sir. Wouldn't it be a wonderful challenge? Okay, did you hear that? Yes, dear, I heard. You'd be a chaplain they'd listen to. A few years ago, I was a Scottish immigrant. And now I'm asked to accept the nomination as chaplain of the United States Senate. Exactly. Of course, Senator, you understand it can't be what I want, or what you want for me, but what God wants. I'd have to have a green light from him before I made any decision. 
Remember a sermon you preached, sir, called The American Dream? Indeed I do. Where every man and woman who owns the name of Jesus must, must fight together to make America good enough to lead the world? To make the American dream of opportunity come true for all? Every man and woman. And this is my chance to fight for that dream. Accept the nomination and you'll be elected. The three of us could serve in the Senate together. It would be a great honor. Not for myself, but a chance to serve God in a new setting. You could reach others as you reached me. You need a conscience in the Senate. It would be a great responsibility. But a wonderful opportunity. The best I've had to serve him. Then with your consent, I'll present the nomination tomorrow. You mustn't nominate me, Senator. Mustn't nominate you? But I don't understand. I can't accept the nomination. Why, sir? My heart. The doctor says if I'm to live with this heart of mine, I must do less and less. Peter. I'm sorry. I didn't know. If the sir I appreciate your thinking of me, Senator. If the circumstances were different, I'd be happy. To of course. Well, I better be going. And Joe, you're overdue for that meeting in the back garden. Yes, sir. Take care, Dr. Marshall. Don't bother to see me out, Mrs. Marshall. I'll manage. Goodbye, Senator. Goodbye. I hope this hasn't been too much of a strain for you, sir. Oh, no, Joe. It's good for me to see you doing so well. And Joe, keep those senators in line. I'll try, sir. Run and play, dear. I'll be out in a minute. Stay quiet, you know, Peter. I will, son. Dear, I know what it cost you to refuse that challenge. I don't want to talk about it, Kate. Well, I better go to that meeting in the back garden. If you want anything, just ring the bell. <coughs> want anything. Oh God, we would find you in the quiet of our hearts, in the privacy of this moment. Help us to know, O oh Lord, that you are near us and beside us. And help us to realize that when we are reaching up to you, you are reaching down to us. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Dr. Marshall. Miss Bickle, what a pleasant surprise. And Alan, too. We brought you an Easter bouquet. Oh, that's very thoughtful. Why don't you have a seat? Thank you. Let me put these lemon flowers in some water. It's been a long time, sir. Too long. Army life seems to agree with you. Doesn't he look handsome in his uniform? Now, Aunt Jessie, you'll turn my head. These days, I say what I feel. I wasted too much of my life, afraid to speak out. How is your sister? Very different. As a matter of fact, Aunt Judith is outside now. Outside? We'll ask her in. She won't come in. She's embarrassed, Dr. Marshall. I think Judith feels Kindly like she... Kindly stop telling people what I feel and don't, Jessie. Judith! Miss Bickle, come in. I am in. I don't know what these two have been saying about me. Something Dr. Marshall hadn't already suspected, Aunt Judith. <laughs> I wasn't going to come here today. I'm glad you changed your mind. It's very nice to see you again. I have something to say to you, Dr. Marshall, and putting it off isn't going to make it any easier. So I decided this was a good enough time as any. You don't have to say anything. I do. Good. I've been a member of New York Avenue all my life. In fact, Papa had us both enrolled before we were even born. So you might... Jesse! Over the years, I began to think of New York Avenue as my church. I began to think that my way was the only way to worship. Papa used to call Judith his immovable object. <laughs> then I met you, Dr. Marshall. The irresistible force. <laughs> You came crashing into New York Avenue, knocking all my ideas every which way. Letting Aaron's sunlight into the place. I was afraid to really examine the traditions I defended. So I attacked you. With vigor. <laughs> I was wrong. I was wrong about you, about the church, about Alan. I, 
I almost lost Dan before I realized how wrong I'd been. Judith, you don't have to say Before anything. I faced it to the fact that I was wrong, then God gave me the courage to write Alan and ask for his forgiveness, as I'm asking for yours now. God bless you, Miss Pickle. We need you at New York Avenue. Come back to us soon. After all, what's Peter Marshall's church without Peter Marshall? Oh, Judith, you can be so nice. <laughs> Immoderately nice. <laughs> that reminds me, this is for you. It's not much, but they did tell me it was old and rare and noisy. A clock. Probably doesn't keep good time at all. <laughs> I've never had a nicer gift. So, Alan, how are things with you? All right. You've adjusted to army life. I had to. It wouldn't just to me. <laughs> you know, sir, there have been some rough times, but thanks to you, I knew where to turn for help. I'm glad to hear you say that, Alan. You know, when you were running away, you were running away from our Lord, from the ministry. Instead, I ran right into his arms. Alan, are you saying that? as soon as my military duty's over, I'm going to study for the ministry. Alan, that's wonderful. Isn't it? I'm so happy. I've just cried and cried. And your doubts, all gone. I was excusing myself by turning you into a sort of superman who never had problems, never had a struggle. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I know that now. The greatness in you, sir, comes from your refusal to give up, even when the odds seem all against you. You've committed your life to him, and you never once allowed yourself to forget that. I've tried to keep my bargain with God. I'm, gonna need a, I'm going to need all the help I can get. But come up, may I'm going to turn my life over to him, to use as he sees fit. He'll make good use of you, Alan. He's given you a sanctified imagination. Alan's being shipped overseas next week, Dr. Marshall. So soon. Don't worry, Alan. God will keep you in his care. I'm not afraid. Once I might have been, but not It's anymore. only when we don't know him that we're afraid. When we do, there's nothing left to fear. When we're no longer afraid to die, then we're no longer afraid to live. I've tried to explain that to some of the men, sir. If we're no longer afraid of death, then we're no longer afraid at all. And when we're no longer afraid to die, then we begin to live. It isn't how long we live, but how well. Whether or not we've kept our bargain with God. I was going to check in the gang in the back garden anyway. <laughs> Alan, wait. Ask the gang to come in. In here? That's right. All of them. All right, Mrs. Marshall. Perhaps Judith and I better leave if we're... No, up. please. No, I want to stay. We want you to stay. <laughs> Don't we, Peter? Indeed, we do. Why, I have noticed. Are your clocks are stopped? Oh, a foolish whim of mine. We're starting them all again. Aren't we, Peter? If it's what we both want. It's what we both want. We've lost so much time. Alan said we should come in here. That's right. But I thought the doctor... You're feeling better, sir? Much better. Immoderately good. <laughs> and Joe. Yes, Mrs. Marshall? He's going to call the senator and tell him that we want to try for that nomination. Kate? What nomination? Dr. Marshall's going to be nominated as chaplain of the United States Senate. Barbara, can you still play the piano? Yes, sir, if you're sure. Play something, Barbara. Something scotch and loud. How about Lock Lomond? Daddy, the doctor says! I know. Let's just hear you sing, laddie. Sing loud.